When you get your first radio controlled vehicle, the experience can be so fun, but there can also be quite a bit to learn and mistakes made. Because of this, we're gonna run down our top 10 tips for beginners to help you save you time energy, and money. Most of these tips are intended for people who purchased ready to run vehicles, but some of these tips can apply to kits. So let's start it. The very first tip is something super simple, but can be often overlooked in the rush of excitement, and that is to just read the manual. The instruction manual that came with your vehicle has tons of great information about the vehicle, the transmitter, batteries that may be included, the engine if it's a nitro model, and a lot of other really useful info. If you did pick up a nitro vehicle, it's gonna have information about how to properly break in that nitro engine, which you're gonna really want to follow. It's really crucial to break in that engine to ensure that it lasts you a long time and runs well. The last thing about the manual is the importance of the exploded parts diagram. This diagram is a great resource to understanding how the parts stack together on your vehicle. So if you need to uh, disassemble or reassemble something, that parts diagram can be really helpful. The diagram also lists all the part numbers to the parts used in your vehicle, so you can use that as a reference later if you break a part, so you can search that part number to find that part later. This is probably the most elementary tip that we have for you, but still a lot of people don't know that when you're ready to turn everything on and go drive, you always turn the transmitter on first and the vehicle second. This way, your transmitter is sending signals the moment your vehicle is turned on. Otherwise, sometimes there could be interference that could be sending signals that your vehicle picks up because it's not picking up the transmitter. Or if you have a nitro model and you try to turn it on without the transmitter, your throttle linkage and all that could be set wide open. It's just a terrible idea. So you should always turn your transmitter on first and the vehicle second. Now, when you're done and you want to turn everything off, you should always turn the vehicle off first and then the transmitter second. This is a really simple and great habit to develop. The main idea here is you just want to cover those holes so nothing gets inside the tire. Now, if your vehicle doesn't have waterproof electronics in the first place, you probably should not be getting it wet. But if it does, what tends to happen in driving in water or mud or any wet conditions is that moisture will get inside the tire and get your foam insert wet. And eventually, that wet foam will degrade if it never dries out. That foam will eventually break down and it'll tear inside the tire when you go use your vehicle and then it'll bunch up in one spot on the tire like a knot and essentially the tires are no good at that point and need to be replaced. So if you just cover up those vent holes beforehand so no moisture can get inside your wheels, your tires will last you a lot longer. Now, when you drive in sand, sand has a way of finding its way into everything. And sand will most definitely find its way inside of your tires through that little vent hole. And when it does, sand will fill up and collect inside your tire and it won't get out and it causes the tire to become really heavy. And then when you consider that your vehicle has four tires that are now filled with sand, they the tires could weigh twice or maybe three times as much as they normally would weigh, which cause your electronics in your vehicle to work double time causing the motor and the ESC to overheat and overwork themselves and it could ultimately lead to those electronics burning up and failing. So the very simple tip of just covering those vent holes with some tape, duct tape, Gorilla tape before driving in sand is a really great idea to ensure your electronics stay healthy. Now with any slow moving vehicles like a rock crawler, covering up those vent hole wheels is still a good idea, but it's not nearly as important as it is with really high speed, high powered brushless um, or nitro vehicles. Now, if you are getting your vehicle wet, it's a great idea afterwards to wipe it down with an old rag or spray it down with an air compressor afterwards to get it all dry. Moisture is not only bad for your foam tire inserts, but overall it's not great for your vehicle and the chassis. Now, if you're driving in mud, the same thing kind of applies. You wanna just clean off your vehicle afterwards. You can use your old towel to kind of wipe some of it off. I've got a few brushes that I use when I get our vehicles really dirty, but keeping your vehicle clean is gonna help it last a lot longer. Dirt, grime, and dust has a way of working itself into some of your suspension components and into the drivetrain. So once you've finished cleaning up your car, it's good to just inspect it 
check it over, see if anything looks loose or if any screws are backing out. Sometimes I'll just take a shock off of the suspension arm and the shock tower if it's an independent suspension. And that way you can see if the suspension arm assembly freely drops under its own weight to ensure there's no binding. Binding in your suspension is gonna be really bad and alter the performance of the vehicle. Every now and then, it's also a great idea to remove the motor or engine from the vehicle and just ensure that the drivetrain spins freely under its own weight. Any resistance in the drivetrain or binding will put a lot of unnecessary stress and heat on your electronics. Now when it's time to do some serious tinkering and tuning on your vehicle, having the right tools will make all the difference. Most ready to run vehicles as well as kits will include those little L-shaped Allen wrenches, but those things are kind of pretty cumbersome to use. They're not very long. They're difficult to apply a lot of torque to, and eventually they just really dig into your hand and your palm. So picking up a quality set of tools like some hex drivers that have nice long proper tips on them with big chunky handles that you can apply a lot of torque to are gonna make all of the difference. The same goes with having the proper nut drivers. It's the same principle. They're gonna be way easier to use than those little L-shaped Allen wrenches or a little T-style nut wrench that may come with your vehicle. Having the proper tools to work on your vehicle is going to be a game changer for you. And you'll find that you'll probably be able to do the same work in half the time. Now the last thing about tools is that some people will use pliers like this with their shocks, which is really bad. Like the shock shaft or the shock body, those parts need to be scratch free in order to be very smooth and not leak. So a really good tool to have for your shocks is some sort of shock pliers. These pliers, you can grip the shock shaft or the shock body and it helps prevent any scratching to those really precise suspension parts. The next tip is with Loctite and it's a great idea to use Loctite whenever you have a metal screw that screws into some other metal piece or part. It could be an aluminum, a brass, uh, or maybe even a steel part. Screw, metal screws threaded into metal parts tend to back out and unthread themselves over time. We recommend using a medium or a blue thread locker for those RC parts. And this is especially true with any nitro vehicle because the engine vibrations tend to just rattle the screws back out pretty dang quickly. Now, if you're screwing into plastic, you don't have to over tighten or torque down screws too much into plastic and you can strip them out. If it has stripped a bit and the screw just keeps spinning and spinning, it's probably okay. You can just leave it in there and it probably won't back out. If that screw is backing out of the plastic piece, one tip is to remove the screw, put CA glue on the threads, and then reinstall that screw. The CA will dry, it'll fill in the gaps of the stripped threads, and it'll hold the screw in place, and you'll still be able to remove that screw later on. The gearing included on your ready to run vehicle is the optimal gearing for just general driving and to ensure that the motor doesn't get too hot. For the best long-term life of your electric motor, it's best to keep the temperatures below 170 degrees Fahrenheit or about 76 and a half degrees Celsius. Now the tendency for most people is that they, they wanna go faster. How fast can I make it? So gearing up or using a larger pinion gear is a great way to get a little bit extra top speed out of your vehicle, but it also generates more heat. So paying attention to the motor temperatures is really crucial. Using a temp gun kind of like this will allow you to meter the motor and get an accurate reading of what the temperature actually is. Every time I gear up or change the gearing in a vehicle, I'll go outside on the very first drive, I'll drive for a few minutes and then check the temps to ensure I'm within that safe zone. I recommend that you do the same if you're going to be changing your gearing. Now a lot of ready to run vehicles these days will include optional gearing for speed runs to hit the maximum top speed of the vehicle. That optional gearing is only recommended for those speed runs. If you use that higher gearing for general driving, it will most definitely overheat the motor and possibly the speed controller. 
The same can happen if you're using larger diameter tires than the tires that came with your vehicle because larger diameter tires will effectively change the rollout of the vehicle and it's kind of like using a larger sized pinion gear. So if you're gonna make that swap, it's a good idea to make sure that first run you use those tires that your motor temps are okay and if they're not with those larger tires, you might wanna gear down to a smaller pinion gear. Now on the flip side of gearing up your vehicle are all the aftermarket electronics that you can use for more speed. Things like uh, more powerful brushless systems, more powerful light bulb batteries, and faster motors. When you're new, it's really easy to get caught up in how fast the vehicle is and how fast you can make it. My best tip here before you go out and set any new land speed records is to just take the time and be patient to build up your driving skills with the car how it is. Adding in more power and speed to your vehicle will ultimately make it harder to control. And a vehicle that is hard to control is really easy to crash. If you have extra RC money and you're really itching to just upgrade your car, some of my favorite upgrades are different tires to better suit the terrain I'm driving in, and then maybe a stronger steering servo or a faster steering servo are great options. Shoot, we've made an entire video on RC upgrades, uh, which you can check out if you want to. But as you're new in the hobby, try not to go too fast too soon. LiPo batteries are one of the greatest advancements that RC vehicles have ever seen, but they do require some care and maintenance. Now, a few tips about caring for your LiPo batteries. First, always use the balance mode on your battery charger. I recommend you check out your charger manual for more information on the balance mode and how to use it on your charger. But my point here is to just always use the balance mode and balance charger batteries. Over time, a battery that hasn't been balance charged will become unbalanced. The cells inside will be at different voltages. One can be really high and one can be really low. And in this case, it's pretty dang dangerous. I'll use a cell checker like this every once in a while to plug my batteries in and actually be able to see the cell voltages and ensure those cells are balanced just for my own peace of mind, even though I still always balance charge. The second tip with LiPo care is if you fully charge your battery to 100%, go out and use it. Leaving a battery fully charged for days on end is the most harmful and damaging thing to that light bulb battery for its long-term health. If you aren't able to use that fully charged battery for some reason, your charger should have a storage mode where you can plug that battery into your charger on the storage mode and it will discharge your battery to a safe and healthy level. The third and last tip for LiPo care is something pretty dang simple. When you're done using your battery, just disconnect it from the vehicle and take it out of the vehicle. Now the number one tip that I have for you guys as you start out on your radio control journey is to just remember that things break. Parts can only withstand so much of an impact in a crash and they can only withstand so much wear and tear before they bend, snap, or crack. Most RC cars are really high performance vehicles and they have extremely high power to weight ratios. So it can be really easy to break parts if you're crashing hard or if you have a really fast vehicle, the drivetrain components, they do wear out over time and need to be replaced. So just keep in mind that there are replacement parts out there and available. You can get factory OEM parts or there's tons of aftermarket accessories to choose from. Just be sure to set some money aside for parts that you may need in the future and go have fun. Guys, I hope this video was helpful for you. Leave this video a like, hit that subscribe button, and leave us any questions or comments down below. I'm Brett from A Main Hobbies. Thanks for watching.